Now, I am a, a new uh, professor here at the University of Birmingham, and I'm going to start just start with a very brief story and then an introduction of our speaker this evening. Long ago and far away, in a country on the other side of the Atlantic, there was a young man with a gleam in his eye and a dream of one day being a professor of theology and religious studies. And lo and behold, a wonderful opportunity opened up for this young man in beautiful Santa Barbara, California, at a college where they were looking for a professor of theology and religious studies. But, but he, this young man had a problem that he needed a letter, a strong letter, to give him favor with the, uh, the review committee. And so he contacted his apologetics professor. And yes, he got a very strong letter. And this professor even gave him a copy of the letter so he could see the nice things that had been written about him. And this professor had further opportunities after teaching in California. And eventually, he ended up at the University of Birmingham, where he had the op opportunity to introduce his former apologetics professor. So I think you've guessed uh, the meaning of the story. So it is a great privilege to be here and to introduce my former professor from years ago, William Lane Craig. I'm just going to read briefly some of the information from the Reasonable Faith website, which is not coming out of my pocket right now. Here we go. William Lane Craig is research professor of philosophy at Talbot School of Theology and professor of philosophy at Houston Baptist University. He and his wife, Jan, have two grown children. At the age of 16, as a junior in high school, he first heard the message of the Christian gospel and yielded his life to Christ. Dr. Craig pursued his undergraduate studies at Wheaton College, graduate studies at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, followed by the University of Birmingham here, the University of Munich in Germany, where he earned uh, two doctorates, one in philosophy and one in theology. He, he later taught uh, philosophy of religion at Trinity and uh, later moved to Brussels, Belgium, and pursued research at the University of Louvain, assuming a position later at Talbot in 1994. I won't even begin to list all the books that uh, uh, Dr. Craig has written, over 30 books. And um, you, if you're interested in finding out more, you can uh, not only look at his books, but also look at the website, reasonablefaith.org. You also can do a YouTube search under William Lane Craig, and you'll find literally hundreds of, of hits and different uh, presentations that Dr. Craig has done in various locations. The theme of the lecture tonight is the challenge of Platonism. Will you help me in wel welcoming Dr. William Lane Craig? Thank you very much. It's good to see some familiar faces back again this evening. In my first lecture, I explained that Platonism, which I defined as the view that uncreated abstract objects exist, represents the chief challenge to the traditional doctrine of divine aseity. Tonight, we want to unfold that challenge more fully. There are today two very different views on offer, both claiming the label of Platonism. One is a sort of heavyweight Platonism, which takes abstract objects to be just as real as physical objects which make up the world. For this sort of Platonist, numbers are just like automobiles, only more numerous, eternal, and abstract. Such a comparison might make us smile, but it serves to underline the seriousness of the heavyweight Platonist's ontological commitment to abstract objects. As Michael Dummett says, the mathematician is therefore concerned on this view with the correct description of a special realm of reality comparable to the physical realms described by the geographer and the astronomer. Our ontological inventory of the world must therefore include things like numbers along with concrete objects. By contrast, there is also a sort of lightweight Platonism, 
whose ontological commitment to abstract objects is much more obscure. For these thinkers, abstract objects seem to be merely semantic objects. They are what we are talking about when we use abstract terms like three or the square root of nine. They need be no more real than grammatical objects. Something can be grammatically the direct object of a sentence without being a really existing object. As in the sentence, the secretary knew the whereabouts of the prime minister. Similarly, the whereabouts of the prime minister can be semantically a term we use to talk about his whereabouts. That is, the term refers to his whereabouts without implying that there is some really existing object which is the prime minister's whereabouts. And lest you think this a bizarre example, a person's whereabouts is precisely one of the examples the Platonist philosopher Bob Hale uses to illustrate the abstract objects which serve as the semantic reference of certain terms. These lightweight Platonists, who are among some of the most ardent defenders of Platonism today, thus seem to be committed to abstract objects only in the sense that they are semantic objects. Such lightweight Platonism is not incompatible with God's being the sole, ultimate reality and creator of everything else that exists other than God Himself. As the lightweight Platonist John Burgess explains, one very traditional sort of way to try to make sense of the question of the ultimate metaphysical existence of numbers would be to turn the ontological question into a theological question. Did it or did it not happen on one of the days of creation that God said, let there be numbers? And there were numbers, and God saw the numbers, that they were good. According to Dummett, and according to Nietzsche, or my perspective on Nietzsche, this is the only way to make sense of questions of ontological metaphysics. I myself believe, like Russell, that analytic atheism, the thesis that theological language is meaningless, is false, and suspect, contrary to the Australians, that the nietzsche dummett thesis is true. If, as I believe, the theological question does make sense, and if, as I suspect, it is the only sensible question about the italics added real, or capital R, real existence of numbers, then I would answer that question in the negative. But then I would equally answer in the negative the question about the real existence of just about anything. Burgess rejects what he calls capital R realism in favor of a much weaker, lowercase realism. This weak realism does not presume to tell us, quote, just what God was saying to himself when he was creating the universe, end quote. The fact that Burgess thinks that very few things exist in the metaphysically heavy sense merely goes to show that he agrees with certain metaphysicians that composite material objects do not exist. For Burgess, very few kinds of things exist, perhaps only fundamental particles, and abstract objects are not among them. He actually seems to be an anti-realist about abstract objects. The focus of our investigation, therefore, is heavyweight Platonism, for this is the only kind of Platonism that is in conflict with the doctrine of divine aseity. From now on then, whenever I refer to Platonism, it is metaphysically heavyweight Platonism that I have in mind. We shall want to understand what grounds there are for affirming heavyweight Platonism and how one might respond to it. In the contemporary debate over Platonism, there is one argument that is predominant, the so-called indispensability argument. 
The argument's claim is that we are committed to the reality of abstract objects by many of the statements we take to be true, such as mathematical statements like 1 plus 1 equals 2. Although the indispensability argument for Platonism originated with W. V. O. Quine, subsequent discussion has largely overtaken Quine's version of the argument, which was predicated upon a number of idiosyncratic and now widely rejected theses. Today, there is a variety of versions of the indispensability argument on tap, free of Quine's more controversial theses. Mark Balaguer nicely epitomizes such arguments as follows. Premise 1. If a simple sentence, that is to say a sentence of the form A is F, or A is R related to B, or whatever, is literally true, then the objects that its singular terms denote exist. Likewise, if an existential sentence is literally true, then there exist objects of the relevant kinds. For example, if there is an F is true, then there exist some Fs. Premise 2. There are literally true simple sentences containing singular terms that refer to things that could only be abstract objects. Likewise, there are literally true existential statements whose existential quantifiers range over things that could only be abstract objects. Three, therefore, abstract objects exist. Let's unpack these premises for the sake of those who are unfamiliar with the argument. Premise one states a criterion of ontological commitment. It does not tell us what exists, but it does claim to tell us what must exist if a sentence we assert is to be true. It is intended to reveal to us what our discourse commits us to ontologically. According to premise one, we make ontological commitments in two ways. According to the first part of premise one, we make ontological commitments by means of singular terms. Singular terms are words or phrases which we use to single out something. They include proper names like John, HMS Bounty, Blue Velvet, and so on. Definite descriptions like the man in the gray suit, your sister-in-law, my worst nightmare, and so on. And demonstrative terms like this pancake, that boy, and so on. And the claim of premise one is that if a simple sentence of the form A is F is literally true, then the object denoted by its singular term exists. For example, in the sentence, the Titanic was a huge ocean liner, the term Titanic denotes the Titanic, or in other words, the Titanic is the denotation of the singular term Titanic. Accordingly, since the sentence the Titanic was a huge ocean liner is literally true, the Titanic exists. Notice Balaguer's qualification that the sentence must be literally true. Sentences employing metaphors or other figures of speech may be true, but they are not literally true. It may be true, for example, that it's raining cats and dogs, but it would be obtuse to think that someone asserting such a sentence believes that there are animals falling from the sky. He simply means that it's raining hard. Singular terms employed in non-literal speech are not ontologically committing for their user. But premise one states that if a simple sentence with a singular term is literally true, then there must exist an object corresponding to the singular term used in the sentence. Why 
simple sentences. What Balaguer is trying to avoid is not complexity, but sentences involving intentional contexts, intentional with an S. Intentional contexts are non-extensional contexts, again with an S. Extensional contexts are sentence phrases which have two characteristics. First, singular terms referring to the same entity can be switched without affecting the sentence's truth value. For example, the sentence, the morning star is Venus, is an extensional context because one could substitute the co-referring term, the evening star, for the morning star without affecting the sentence's truth value. Whether you say the morning star is Venus or the evening star is Venus, you have uttered a true sentence. By contrast, the sentence, ancient Babylonian astronomers believed that the morning star rises in the morning, is an intentional context because the substitution of the evening star for the co-referring term, the morning star, would yield a false sentence. Babylonian astronomers did not believe that the evening star rises in the morning. Secondly, one can quantify into such contexts from outside the context. For example, the sentence, Mars has two moons, permits us to infer there is something which is a moon of Mars. By contrast, the sentence Le Verrier sought to discover Vulcan between Mercury and the Sun involves an intentional context because we cannot infer that there is something that Le Verrier sought to discover. The criterion of ontological commitment proposed by one does not apply when it comes to intentional contexts. For example, use of the singular term, the boogeyman, in the true statement, Johnny fears the boogeyman, does not commit us to the reality of the boogeyman. The inapplicability of one's criterion of ontological commitment to intentional contexts implies that it will be useless for vast stretches of human discourse, for intentional attitudes, modal operators, and temporal operators all establish intentional context. It applies only to sentences which are extensional. Singular terms are not the only devices of ontological commitment, according to premise one. The second part of one claims that we also make ontological commitments by means of existential sentences. As Balaguer makes clear in the second part of premise two, he is talking about sentences which involve so-called existential or particular quantifiers. In contrast to universally quantified statements, which are true with respect to all the domain, uh, members of a domain of quantification, existentially quantified statements are true with respect to some of the members of the domain of quantification. For example, if our domain of quantification is bears, then the statement, some bears live near the North Pole, is true just in case at least one member of the domain lives near the North Pole. In ordinary English, there is a variety of informal existential quantifiers, such as some, at least one, there is, or are, and there exists. All of these informal expressions are captured in formal logic by the formal existential quantifier. A statement like, some bears live near the North Pole, has the form exhibited on the PowerPoint slide, which is to be read, there is some X such that X is a bear and X lives near the North Pole. In order for the sentence to be true, 
there must be at least one thing in the domain that can be the value of the variable x. Balaguer is evidently talking about first order logic where the variables x, y, z take individual things as their values. Now, the claim of premise one is that the literal truth of simple sentences involving existential quantification of the form there is an f commits us to the reality of the object which is an f. Here f stands for a general term like a man, buffalo, facts which science has yet to discover, and so on. Such sentences can be symbolized as there is an x such that x is an f. The existential quantifier is claimed to express existence not in a metaphysically lightweight sense, but rather in a metaphysically heavyweight sense. It is a device for making ontological commitments. Thus the person who makes assertions involving informal quantifiers like some and there is or there are thereby commits himself to the reality of the things in the domain of quantification, which as Balaguer puts it in his premise too, his quantifiers range over, that is to say the things which are the values of the variables in sentences he regards as true. So, in sum, what premise one expresses is not an ontological claim, but a meta-ontological claim about how a person commits himself ontologically. The claim is that singular terms and existential quantification are devices of ontological commitment. Turn now to premise two. It claims that the denotations or reference of certain singular terms in literally true simple sentences for example, 2 plus 2 equals 4, cannot plausibly be taken to be concrete objects of any kind. For example, the reference of such mathematical terms as 2 plus 2 and 4 are clearly abstract objects. Premise 2 also excludes taking such mathematical discourse to be some sort of figurative language, not to be taken literally. It claims that at least some abstract discourse is literally true and therefore commits its user to the reality of abstract objects. In the second part of premise two it is likewise claimed that there are literally true existentially quantified statements involving quantification over abstract objects. For example, there is a prime number between 2 and 4, or there are prime numbers greater than 100. Again, such statements are not to be construed metaphorically along the lines of there's a bee in her bonnet. So existentially quantified abstract discourse also commits its user to the reality of abstract objects. From premises one and two, um, the conclusion three follows that abstract objects exist. If such objects exist a se, as Platonists claim, then the classical theist must reject either premise one or premise two. Most Christian philosophers, not to speak of theologians, are largely unaware of the wide range of responses to the indispensability argument which are on offer today. If we take mathematical objects as a case in point, then we can portray some of the many options in figure one, featured on the PowerPoint slide. Notice that the various options can be classed as realist, mathematical objects exist, anti-realists, mathematical objects do not exist, or a-realist, there is no fact of the matter concerning the existence of mathematical objects. Now as figure one illustrates, 
there are two brands of realism about mathematical objects. Views which take them to be abstract objects and then views which take them to be concrete objects. Of realist views which consider mathematical objects to be abstract, absolute creationism is a sort of modified Platonism, holding that mathematical objects have, like concrete objects, been created by God, thus safeguarding divine aseity. Concretist versions of realism can take mathematical objects to be either physical objects or mental objects, the latter either in human minds or in God's mind. The most promising concretist view is some sort of divine conceptualism, the heir to the view of Philo and the Church Fathers. When we turn to anti-realist responses to the indispensability argument, we find a cornucopia of different views. Neutralism rejects the criterion of ontological commitment expressed in premise one, taking the use of singular terms and existential quantification to be neutral with respect to ontological commitments. Fictionalism accepts the Platonists' criterion of ontological commitment, but denies that mathematical statements are true. Figuralism holds that mathematical discourse is true, but denies that it must be taken literally. Neo-Minongianism holds that there are objects referred to by abstract singular terms, but takes these objects to be non-existent. Pretense theory considers mathematical discourse to be a species of make-believe, so that mathematical objects are akin to fictional characters. Paraphrastic strategies like constructibilism and modal structuralism hold that we can offer paraphrases of mathematical statements which will preserve their truth value but without ontological commitment to abstract objects, and so on. In between realism and anti-realism about mathematical objects is ah-realism, the view that there just is no fact of the matter about the reality of mathematical objects. Is this an option that might be available to theists eager to preserve divine aseity? The classic version of ah realism was the conventionalism of Rudolf Carnap. He drew a fundamental distinction between what he called internal questions and external questions, that is to say questions which are posed within an adopted linguistic framework and questions posed by someone outside that framework. Carnap gives the illustration of what he calls the thing framework or language. Once we have adopted the linguistic framework in which we speak of observable things in a spatio-temporal system, we can meaningfully raise uh, internal questions like, is the moon a thing? Or is a school of fish a thing? Someone who rejects the language of things may choose to speak instead of mere appearances such as sense data. Similarly, once we have adopted a linguistic framework involving terminology for abstract objects like numbers, internal questions like, is there a prime number greater than 100, are meaningful. No one who has adopted the framework would seriously raise the question, are there numbers? for their existence is necessary once one has adopted the number framework. For someone who is outside the framework, Carnap insisted, the question is meaningless. As a logical positivist and verificationist, Carnap was convinced that such metaphysical questions have no cognitive content. Whether one adopts the linguistic framework in which it makes sense to speak of numbers 
is just a matter of convenience or convention, hence the name conventionalism. Now, no philosopher today would defend Carnap's verificationism, but his conventionalism does find an echo today in what we might call meta-ontological anti-realism or ontological pluralism. According to these thinkers, certain ontological questions, though meaningful, do not have objective answers. Some non-realists, notably the philosophers of mathematics, Mark Balaguer and Penelope Maddy, would deny that the question, do mathematical objects exist, has an answer that is objectively true or false. On ah realism, there just is no fact of the matter whether or not mathematical objects exist. Now, at first blush, ah realism might seem a quick and easy solution to the challenge posed by Platonism to divine aseity. If there is no objective truth about whether or not mathematical objects exist, then the use of mathematical terminology is devoid of ontological significance. Internal questions about the existence of certain sets or numbers or solutions to equations may be answered affirmatively, but there just is no answer to the external question of the existence of such entities. In that case, one cannot truthfully assert that there are objects which God did not create. Alas, however, there is no succor for the theist here. For given God's metaphysical necessity and essential aseity, there just is no possible world in which uncreated mathematical objects exist. Hence, there most certainly is a fact of the matter whether uncreated abstract objects exist. They do not and cannot exist. Therefore, ah, realism is necessarily false, as is conventionalism about existence statements concerning mathematical and other abstract objects. Still, Carnap's discussion is not without merit, and many contemporary philosophers find his distinction between internal and external questions to be intuitive and helpful. We shall have occasion to return to it. Putting aside ah realism then, we're left with a number of both realist and anti-realist solutions to the challenge posed by Platonism to divine aseity. In our forecoming lectures, we'll need to see which of them offers the most promise for an answer to the indispensability argument and thus to the challenge of Platonism. We have time for questions for Dr. Craig, and I would ask you please to speak up clearly and loudly and uh, to keep your question concise. Yes. Okay, I remember watching uh, a John Lennox talk hmm. on, uh, which I'm internet and multiple thing, where he talks about uh, how semiotics is a good um, argument for the uh, existence of a mind, as it cannot really be applied to uh, like a, a reductionist principle um, of what we see in mathematics in particular. Um, do you think that, where would he sit on all those scales, um, do you know? I don't know. He's a mathematician, and it would be very interesting to ask him, John, do you think that mathematical objects actually exist and I, I don't know what his answer to that question would be. Many times practicing mathematicians never really reflect on these questions because these are metaphysical or philosophical questions that are quite irrelevant to the day-to-day -day work of the practicing mathematician. So very often practicing mathematicians may not have a, an opinion on these issues, but I don't know about him. Yes? Why, I, I might be being foolish here, but why are the ideas in the divine mind concrete rather than abstract? This relates to the question that was posed earlier about what differentiates concrete from abstract, and I have been skating on the surface, obviously, here in, the, in these lectures. 
Um, but the most widely accepted criterion that differentiates abstract from concrete entities would be causal efficacy. And thoughts, particularly thoughts in God's mind, would clearly be causally efficacious. Uh, so that it is widely recognized among philosophers who believe in thoughts as things, that they believe thoughts exist, that these would be concrete objects, not abstract objects. So um, an abstract object will be something that is essentially causally a feat or impotent. Things like a number or a property or a proposition, things of that sort. Yes? As you know, one of the standard ways of saying what it is for something to be abstract is that it's not space and time, <coughs> which is orthogonal to whether or not it's causally efficacious. So if you think God uh, isn't in space and time but does do stuff, causally do stuff, yes. you get a cross classification of these different ways of thinking. The proposal that spatiotemporality can serve as a criterion differentiating abstract from concrete objects, I think, is susceptible to decisive counterexamples and therefore isn't uh, an adequate criterion. In the first place, as you just indicated, you could have objects existing beyond space and time that are nevertheless causally efficacious, like God. God is clearly a concrete object if he exists, and yet he wouldn't be a spatiotemporal object on classical theism. Moreover, there are abstract objects that are spatiotemporal. Michael Dummett gives the example of the equator, for example. The equator is a mathematical line that encircles the Earth, is about 25,000 miles uh, long, and it's clearly existing in space and time. Uh, you can step over it. Um, so this is clearly a spatiotemporal abstract object if it exists. Or take the center of mass of the solar system. The center of mass of the solar system is moving around in space as the objects in the solar system orbit the sun. Uh, this is an abstract object that you could hold in the hollow of your hand. But not very long because it would soon pass right through it and be somewhere else. Uh, propositions that change their truth value from true to false or false to true would be in time if not in space because they would be undergoing change. So I think that the criterion of spatiotemporality is an inadequate criterion for distinguishing abstract from concrete objects and that the causal efficacy criterion is therefore a better criterion. Yes? But might someone say mental objects by themselves don't have any causal power? What don't? Uh, mental objects, like thoughts. Uh -huh. It's only when they're combined with a body, <coughs> take the example of human thoughts, mm. that they're able to cause anything. Well, I guess that depends on whether or not you're a dualist with respect to mind-body relations. Uh, if you're a dualist, you think that mental events do cause um, not only bodily movements, but can cause other thoughts. You can cause other mental events to occur by, by thinking. Um, so in that case, you would have not only causal directionality from body to mind, but also from mind to body, and then mind within the mind as thoughts can cause other thoughts. And as a theist, again, I think that God is causally efficacious and he's not connected to a body. So I don't think that, the, um, that this criterion of spatiotemporality is, is a good one for differentiating abstract from concrete, nor do I think it would suggest that uh, mental thoughts, if they exist, are abstract objects rather than concrete objects. Yes, way in the back. Can you uh, talk about something concrete and abstract, abstract as existing? How do you define the term existence? What, what, does, what does it mean to say that it exists? Well, this is very difficult. Uh, the, your question was how do you define what it means to exist, right? 
this is a profound philosophical question to which there is no uncontroversial answer. Um, what Quine did in his essay on what exists was not give us a criterion for an existence, but a criterion for ontological commitment. The indispensability argument is saying that if you hold certain sentences to be true, then you are committed to the existence of those things. So it's not claiming that those things exist, it's claiming that you're committed to their existence. And that's enough for the indispensability argument for abstract objects to go through whatever one might use as a criterion for existence. If I'm right that there are no abstract objects, that anti-realism is true, then the causal efficacy criterion would suffice for a criterion of existence as well as concreteness. But I don't want to go that far because there could be created abstract objects like fictional characters perhaps or musical compositions and I don't have any theological stake in that debate. Yes? You said that what you have said is incompatible with the doctrine of divine simplicity. With the divine simplicity. You said that God is totally efficacious, God is a concrete object, but according to the doctrine of divine simplicity. You need to speak a little louder, Professor. God, God is identical to yes. his property. God is love itself. Right. But properties are not. As we'll, I think we'll see, at least we'll see in, in the book that these lectures are producing, uh, divine simplicity is one of the recourses that the absolute creationist might appeal to, to try to save his view from a certain very powerful objection. What he might say is that there are no such things as God's properties, rather God just is his properties, and therefore he doesn't create his own properties, he just is his properties. Now, I'm going to argue against that point of view. I, I think there are really good objections to divine simplicity. But in any case, that wouldn't solve the problem of mathematical objects, would it? I, I mean, that would only deal with one kind of abstract object properties. It would only deal with properties that God possesses. It wouldn't do anything to deal with the property of being black, for example or being, having a certain weight, because God isn't identical to those properties. So that will be, I think, a very limited recourse that absolute creationists can try to appeal to avoid the dilemma of saying that God creates his own properties and therefore creates his own nature, which is very problematic, I think. So that should come up in tomorrow evening's lecture. Uh, when we'll look at realist alternatives uh, to uh, Platonism, principally absolute creationism and divine conceptualism. Yes? So, um, with regard to properties, I'm just wondering kind of how properties get cashed out typically on uh, anti-realism, because um, it looks like some of the motivations you've given for divine aseity are going to be very strong motivations also to hold the divine simplicity. Because if one holds that in any way properties are, whether abstract or concrete, are real things, and that God has multiple properties, then one might think that God is composed of and therefore dependent on some pleasure of either concrete or abstract things. Well, there isn't any single alternative concerning anti-realist views of properties. It's going to depend whether you're a neutralist, a fictionalist, a pretense theorist, um, a neo minongian uh, all of these different anti-realisms can take different points of view on properties, but what they will deny is that there are properties that, that um, so when, when right, right. Now, if you get to the realist branch, you could say, well, even though there are properties, they're not abstract objects, they're concrete objects of some sort. Um, and that would be a different alternative, but you asked about anti-realist views of properties, and that would just be the view that there are no such thing as properties. And then what you do with 
property talk or sentences involving reference to property is going to depend on which of the anti-realist alternatives you'll, you'll adopt. And we'll say more about those later on. Yes? <clears throat> what theory of truth are you adopting here? Correspondence theory, or was that related? That, again, will depend, I think, on which of these various views you um, adopt. I, I think that um, one can accept a kind of de deflationary or disquotational view of truth where a sentence S is true if and only if S. So the sentence snow is white is true if and only if snow is white. And the more important claim will be, is a sentence like 2 plus 2 equals 4 literally true? And if it is, does that commit you to the reality of 2 plus 2 and 4? Or is it merely figuratively true, as the figuralist would say? Or is it something we make believe to be true, as the pretense theorist would say? Or is it literally true, but ontologically non-committing, as the neutralist would say? Or is it committing, but in fact 2 plus 2 isn't an abstract object, it's a thought in the mind of God. All of these views would be consistent with a correspondence view of truth, but what will separate them will be things like the literality of the sentence and whether or not you take the terms in it to have reference and then what those reference are. Those will divide these various alternatives. Yes? I'm, I'm wondering, with all the discussion about Platonism and obviously the New Testament setting yesterday, how does this fit into an Old Testament epistemology and way of thinking? I'm thinking of the story of Elijah with the challenge of Baal, that you've got here a bit of a mix between uh, an idea of the concept of Baal, but God challenging the consequence and the real idolatry in Baal. So you've got the, this construct, this idea of Baal that's, that's not real, but it's real in the minds of people. Yeah. But then God is dealing with the, 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 the outworkings of the idolatry. So I was wondering how this theory would fit with an Old Testament way of thinking. I don't see that there would be any difference between Old and New Testament views with respect to these issues. A sentence like Baal is God is just a false sentence. It's not a true sentence and so um, you're not committed to the existence of Baal by saying something like that. And there isn't any sort of philosophical position in the Old or the New Testament, I think, with regard to these things. These are, these are philosophical issues that involve reflection on the biblical text, but it would be presumptuous to think that any of these are taught by the biblical text. Yes? Um, so again, this is a little bit of catch up because I missed yesterday, so it may be clear to others, but there may be people here like me who weren't here yesterday. Yes. Clarificatory question or some remarks. Now, what, I'm, what I'd like to understand better is uh, exactly what feature or features of God on the one hand and the thing that are Very good. The clash is between God's being. Oh. Um, there were a contingent object that were. So let, let me say that something is a shadow if it's causally um, inefficacious. And let me say that something is a super shadow if it's a non contingent existing shadow. So it's actually causally inert and it necessarily exists. What I'm trying to figure out is, you know, are shadows alone, the existence of shadows alone, is that a problem from the conception of God that the theist you have in mind has, or does it require super shadows as well? So is the non-contingency doing any work, or is it merely the inequities? Um, the clash is between God's status as the sole ultimate reality, 
and the creator of everything that exists other than himself, and then the uncreatedness of these mathematical and other abstract objects. Isn't that fault? Just because they're inefficacious, it doesn't follow. No, it doesn't. It doesn't follow. It's, it's not their abstractness that is problematic. It's their uncreatedness. And that's why I said, in response to the question down here, that I'm not taking any position with regard to whether things like Sherlock Holmes and Beethoven's Fifth Symphony are created abstract objects. That wouldn't be inconsistent with divine aseity. But typically, mathematical objects are not like that. They, two plus two equals four is necessarily true, uh, and, and therefore eternally true. And the objects that are featured in it are independent, uncreated entities on Platonism. So when, so when we go back to the argument and look at premise one, Balaguer's argument, what's really crucial really <coughs> isn't whether they're abstract or concrete in your sense, but whether they're created or concrete. Yes. Yes, and that's why, you see, the absolute creationist will affirm their existence, but say they are created by God. So the premise of the argument really explicitly concerned things that couldn't plausibly be said to be Concrete. Say again. Can we go back and see the slide that has the argument on it? The indispensability argument. Maybe I misremember it. Uh, sorry, premise two. So no, nothing about what's created and what's not created. No, 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 no. This is the, this is the argument for Platonism. Um, but the question as to whether or not these are uncreated objects is going to depend on the type of objects you're talking about. And things like possible worlds, properties, mathematical objects um, are almost universally regarded, if they exist, as necessarily existing uncreated objects. So we're not talking about things like musical compositions and literary figures. We're I'm taking, if you look at my figure one, mathematical objects as our case in point, our paradigmatic example of a problematic entity. I'm just pointing out that whether they're efficacious or not isn't really doing the dialectical work. Whether they're necessarily existing or not yeah. isn't doing the dialectical work. What's doing the dialectical work um, in setting up a conflict with the existence of the kind of God you have in mind? These are uncreated. Right. Which isn't written in the surface of mathematical practice. Whether or not they're, whether or not well, and that's exactly what the absolute creationist says. You see, that's one of the alternatives. Uh, and the easiest alternative uh, is, to, is to just modify your Platonism by saying, yes, all these things exist, but they're created. And that's what we'll look at tomorrow. All right, can we thank our, our lecture? Yeah. Thank you.